Order. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister really understand the anxiety that he and his government is causing to vulnerable carers? Will the Prime Minister give a guarantee to the 400,000 Australian carers that the annual lump sum payments will be delivered in the budget? The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I give an absolute guarantee that those carers will not be a dollar worse off as a result of the budget. The, the member for Blair. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. What is the government doing to begin the important job of reducing the level of binge drinking in Australia? The Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for Blair for his question. Mr Speaker, binge drinking imposes a huge toll on the community. Uh, in any given week, studies uh, indicate that one in ten, that is 168,000 uh, young people aged 12 to 17, are binge drinkers and drinking at risky levels. I notice that the former Minister of Health thinks this is very funny, and given his remarks earlier today, I would suggest he regards this as not a marginal or minority Order. concern, but a real concern for the mainstream community. Order. Commonly defined as seven or more drinks for males and five or more for females, binge drinking is becoming a matter of widespread and legitimate concern in the Australian community. Order. Among 16 and 17 year olds, one in five are drinking at risky levels. Furthermore, young people aged 18 to 24 years have the riskiest drinking patterns, with almost two thirds drinking at risky levels for harm in the short term. Some may ask why is this necessarily a concern, given that we have drinking problems across the entire community. The answer lies in the fact that with adolescents, particularly in the age bracket 14 to 17, studies show that a drinking profile of this nature can result in considerably increased physical harm, which can be irreparable. Therefore, it is a legitimate matter of community concern. In addition to the objective evidence on the costs of binge drinking, there is the untold impact on families and communities across the country. The government is determined to work with the wider community and with parents and with young people themselves to tackle this problem. Strategy won't fix the problem overnight, but it's a solid first step. This will initially involve three measures to tackle binge drinking among our young people. First, I want to work with sporting and other non-government organisations to affect the environments that shape the culture of binge drinking among young people. The government is committing $14.4 million towards a grants-based program focused on binge drinking and to reduce it at the community level. I see this supporting particularly sporting codes and clubs in educating and informing club members about the harms associated with binge drinking. Second, the government will invest $19.1 million to support innovative early intervention and diversion programs to get young people under the age of 18 back on track before more serious alcohol-related problems emerge. These early intervention initiatives will involve a new emphasis on personal responsibility. They will target young people under the age of 18 who have been involved in an episode involving alcohol. Interventions supported could include requiring young people to participate in educational and or diversionary activities and allowing police to confiscate alcohol or provide formal warnings. When young people involved in binge drinking present to hospitals or fall foul of the law, the personal responsibility approach needs to be triggered. The government will endeavour to have at least one pilot project in each state capital operating by the end of 2008. Order. Pilots would require community buy-in from states and other local governments, community and health organisations and local police. Third, the government will invest $20 million in a targeted television, radio and internet-based campaign to confront young people, to confront young people with the costs and consequences of binge driven. This campaign will go through the appropriate approval processes of the new government to make sure that it is advertising not of a political nature but of a public health nature, a practice not engaged in by those who preceded us. Order. Consistent with the government's Order. election commitments, the public information campaign will be evidence-based and non-political. Mr Speaker, I welcome the positive community reaction to these initiatives, and today I inform the House as the next step I'll be taking to, I will be forming uh, very soon 
a uh, collaborative activity with the heads of, heads of sporting codes across Australia. This morning I spoke with Andrew Demetrio from the AFL, the Prime Kate Minister Palmer will from Netball his Australia. Prime Minister will assume his seat. The member for Mackala with a point of order. Mr Speaker, I would refer you to page 554 of the practice, which indicates, as you know, that although there is no specific power under the standing orders to require the minister to conclude shortly, there is discretion in the chair, which has been exercised by your predecessors, uh, where ministers are advised to wind up their uh, answers, because this is properly a statement that should be made after question time and this rests in your hands, Mr. Speaker. I would ask you to. I would ask Order the you Leader would, uh, of the House. Ask him to shorten Order his the Honourable Member will return resume her this seat. The Honourable Member will resume her seat. Prime Minister will continue. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to next steps, uh, today I've held discussions uh, with the heads of the major sporting codes in Australia. I've spoken to Andrew Demetrio from the Australian Football League, Kate Palmer from Netball Australia, David Gallup from the National Rugby League, John O'Neill from the ARU, Ben Buckley from the Football Federation of Australia and James Sutherland from Cricket Australia. I have convened a meeting this Friday to discuss with them how the government will work with peak sporting bodies across Australia to tackle together the challenge of binge drinking which is affecting young people. I will be joined in those discussions by the Minister for Health and the Minister for Support. Millions of Australian kids play sport. We believe that by engaging the peak sporting bodies in this fashion, we have a real opportunity to turn the corner on this problem which is confronting so many families, so many communities right across Australia. Order before calling the member for Warringah. And with fear and trepidation that I might affect Irish-Australian relationships in doing this straight after that question. I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Irish Minister for Transport, Noel Dempsey, and the Irish Ambassador, His Excellency Martin O'Fainan. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. The Member for Warringah. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Uh, will the Prime Minister give a guarantee to over two million seniors? that the annual lump sum payment will be delivered in the coming budget. And I further ask, does the Prime Minister really understand the uncertainty and the anxiety he is causing to older Australians Order. by refusing to guarantee this bonus payment? The Prime Minister. Thanks very much, the Mr Prime Speaker. Minister in response to the honourable member's question, I can guarantee that pensioners, when it comes to their one-off bonuses, will be no worse off under this budget. The member for Chisholm. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Will the minister explain the health impacts of binge drinking and why the government is taking action to combat it? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for this question. I know that uh, the member for Chisholm, along with many others on this side of the House, and I must say, having listened to many of the first speeches on the other side of the House, I think that our concern for young people and the trends of binge drinking that so many of us have watched worryingly increase will be uh, something that many people across, across the whole House will be worried about. And, uh, the Prime Minister has taken the House already through the initiatives that were announced yesterday, but I think it's important that we spend a little bit of extra time just on the sort of impact that this can have on young people, because the binge drinking that we are talking about, we're not just talking about young adults here, we're talking about children in some instances, people be aged between 12 and 17, um, reporting that one in 10 in this age group are regularly binge drinking. So this is hundreds of thousands of children and adolescents and young adults who are repeatedly causing this damage to their own bodies, uh, to their future health, and causing quite a lot of uh, cost and worry within the community. Of course we know, of course we know, well, it's, it's appropriate for the interjections to be raised about middle-aged drinking as well, and it will be something, if the member wants to wait until I complete my answer, I will be able to deal with the questions that have been raised. We regard this as a very serious issue. We know that uh, alcohol, tobacco and obesity are the three biggest risk factors for three of the biggest killers in the country. 
uh, whether it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, whether it's car accidents, whether it's increasing the rates, rates of diabetes. And all of us in this House could do well to think about the way we might not only set good examples for young people, but also encourage other interventions which will help, which will help tackle this serious problem within the community. Now, we know that uh, some of the immediate health effects can be, of course, uh, loss of consciousness, fits, um, alcohol poisoning. We know the much more common diarrhoea, nausea, vomiting. But a lot of people don't know. Order. A lot of people are not aware of the long-term damage that can be caused to the small bowel, to the central nervous system, to the liver and the brain. This is a serious health problem, and for some reason we have seen a massive increase in the number of young people who have taken this binge drinking on as their form of entertainment. We all need to be involved in finding the solutions. The government can do a certain amount. The communities who are already actively engaged and parents who fundamentally need Order to be involved the member, in the you. way that we take and member handle this issue. You. Mr Speaker, I have to say it staggers me that members opposite would think that this is an opportunity for derision. This is a serious health risk to many th hundreds of thousands of young people Order. in the member, in the member for Hume seat, in the shadow minister's seat, in others. Order. Order. From you. Mem the minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members opposite clearly are not aware that 72,000 hospitalisations every year occur as a direct impact of overconsumption of alcohol. That's not taking account of the presentations that result from the long-term effects of excessive consumption of alcohol. So let's understand how serious this problem is. The Rudd Labor government has committed three initial steps which we believe will make a difference. We want to work with parents and community leaders to help bring about change. And we are also going to work with states and territories to talk to them about the areas that they have responsibility for. And we, uh, further in the coming weeks, will announce our preventative health care task force, which has been tasked with prioritising the excessive consumption of alcohol, tobacco and obesity, to look at the long-term changes we need to our health system to make sure that we are sending the message not just to our kids but to the whole community that this is a serious problem that needs to be dealt with. The member for Macpherson. Mem All right, the member for Macpherson. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No. Second. Order. The member has Mr. The Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, can you confirm that your office has received seven letters from Mr. Ashley Norman of Walkerston regarding the carer's lump sum payment? Prime Minister, can you also confirm that your office has lost all seven letters? <laughs> Prime Minister, can you also Order. confirm that when Mr Norman phoned the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs Office on Friday, a senior adviser confirmed that the carer's bonus and allowance had been scrapped? Can you also confirm that when Mr Norman was put through to your office on Friday, one of your senior advisers confirmed that the carer's bonus and allowance had been scrapped? The order. The Prime Minister has the call. Prime Minister. Uh, on the first part of the honourable member's question, I'm unaware of that correspondence. I will seek Order. to see what correspondence has arrived. On the second, I have absolutely nothing to add in terms of my earlier answers. We would not have indicated to uh, a Order. constituent that these um, bonuses Order. were uh, under risk asked of being scrapped. That is not the case. To. Government policy is, government policy is as I have stated it. What is it? What is it? Order. The, the member. The Order the member for North Sydney. The member for Blacksland. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the latest economic figures and what they say about the need for an economic agenda focused on productivity? The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I do thank the, uh, the member for his question. The December quarter national accounts released last week show that growth eased in the quarter, but it still remains very solid. 
Growth was 0.6 per cent in the December quarter, and it was 3.9 per cent over the year. And domestic demand continues to grow strongly. It's driven by strong growth in consumption. Domestic final demand rose by 1.6 per cent in the quarter to be 5.7 per cent higher for the year. Australia's net exports continue to weigh on growth, reflecting ongoing weakness in export volumes and strength in imports. This strong growth in imports is further evidence that domestic demand continues to outpace domestic supply, highlighting the importance of the government's supply-side policies. Mr. Speaker. Now, while domestic demand has been growing strongly, it has not been matched by increases in the economy's productive capacity. The national accounts show that productivity growth in the last year of the Howard Costello government was zero. Zero in the last year of the Howard Costello government. Now, Mr. Speaker, this reflects a pattern of long-term decline in Australia's productivity performance, with average productivity growth over the last five years lower than in any other equivalent period in the last 16 years. And Mr Speaker, this was precisely Order. at the time, precisely at this time Order that Australia's productivity down. growth was declining, declining, underlying inflationary pressures in the Australian economy were building. Now, Mr Speaker, these figures paint a valuable portrait of the economic landscape that we inherited. An economy Order. with strong demand, Mr. Speaker. Order. An economy with strong demand, but shackled by poor productivity growth and capacity constraints in the economy, Mr. Speaker. Now these figures underscore the, the need for for MacArthur, the modernise the Australian the economy, Mr. Boothby. Speaker. These numbers underscore the need to modernise the Australian economy and to the lift for our Dixon. productivity, to the lift for the productive Dixon capacity of the Australian economy. And, Mr. Speaker. This is absolutely the case when there is international uncertainty in the wind. So the Rudd government is prepared to modernise the economy, to make the investments in skills, to provide the political leadership when it comes to infrastructure. But we do acknowledge the challenges, Mr Speaker, and sadly, sadly those opposite Member don't acknowledge Casey. the challenges. The coalition has lost its way. On Sunday, the Leader of the Opposition said that the economy was first rate. Is that right? Is that right? Is that right? Order. Order. Yesterday, the member for North Sydney said it was heading Order. for recession. Three the days member later, for North Sydney. Three days Mem later, Mr. The Treasurer Speaker. resume his seat. Treasurer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the member for Wentworth can't agree with himself. <laughs> He's been out there criticising others for talking down the economy, and this morning on Neil Mitchell, he said as a, a recession is a possibility. Mr. Speaker, the member for Wentworth, Order. the member for Wentworth will say anything and do anything, say anything and do anything to get a headline because he has one job in mind, that's the Leader of the Opposition's job. No policy to deal with inflation, no policy to do with productivity. This is a government that is facing up to the challenges. They're a divided rabble. The member for Warringah. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is uh, again to the Prime Minister. I ask the Prime Minister uh, if he won't guarantee that carers' lump sum payments will be paid uh, in the coming budget, will he alternatively guarantee that carers' payments will be increased uh, by an equivalent amount of $31 a week fully indexed? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I guarantee that carers will not be $1 worse off as a consequence of the budget. Furthermore, furthermore it is time that when we looked Order. at the challenges uh, of carers and pensioners Order. long term, rather than a series of one-off payments made year after year Order. after year by those opposite, including incorporated in so many of their statements leading up to the last election, we, the government, by contrast, are examining ways in which you can place payments to carers and pensioners onto a more secure long-term footing. 
But I repeat what I said before. Order. Carers do a fantastic job across the nation. Order. Carers do a fantastic job across the nation. And when it comes to this upcoming budget, they will not Order be one dollar worse Sydney. off. And in contrast to those who have preceded us, we are examining ways by which we can place payments to carers on a more secure long-term footing. The member for Dawson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. How is the government addressing the barriers to practical action to improve Australia's environmental sustainability by reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions? The Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank, you, I thank the member, I beg your pardon, for his question. Mr Speaker, everybody listening and everyone in this House knows that climate change is the greatest challenge that this and subsequent generations face, and most of the Australian community and most of us in this place are aware of the immensity of the challenge. And I know for certain that those members, neighbours of ours, those members of Pacific Island states continuing to experience the prospects of rising sea levels are amongst those. And fundamentally, this government understands that the basic point is that the cost of inaction on climate change is greater than the cost of action. That's the crucial point, and that's why we're taking action now. Committing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 60 per cent by 2050 on 2000 levels, adopting market-based instruments, including an emissions trading system, to be introduced by 2010, mobilising the tremendous willingness of households and schools and of the business community, all frustrated by a government previously who viewed any action on climate change as an overreaction. Now, Mr Speaker, if there's any doubt about the genuine concerns in the Australian community about the challenges of dangerous climate change, those doubts were put to rest last November. The electorate sent a very clear message that 11 and a half years of denial and delay on climate change should be brought to an end. And in fact, Mr Speaker, I think the community realised then that the former government was actually light years behind the Australian public on the climate change challenge. I say light years, Mr Speaker, because if we cast our minds back to last September, and it's not that long ago, we had backbenchers of the former government disputing the scientific basis for climate change. Mr Speaker, it's the case that it was the former members for Solomon and Lindsay and the current members for Tangney and Hughes who incredibly disputed the validity of the scientific consensus that human activities are contributing to global warming, citing Order. evidence, and I quote, that warming has also been observed on Mars, Jupiter, Triton, Pluto, Neptune and others. That is, that is the case. They were, Mr Speaker, lost in space, light years behind the Australian community and the international community. As it was said at the time in this House, Mr Speaker, they were definitely on another planet. And, but, Mr Speaker, that was last September. And one would have thought that times had moved on, that times had changed. And in fact, they did, because a new government was elected, and its first official act was to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And I note the comments made by the opposition leader that ratification is important. But, Mr. Speaker, I was asked in this question about the barriers to practical action on climate change, and we were reminded of one of the biggest barriers to practical action from a speech given last week by the former Prime Minister when he said, and I quote, Global warming has become a new battleground. The same intellectual bullying and moralising used in other debates now dominates what passes for serious dialogue on this issue. Mr Speaker, if we want to talk about serious barriers to action on climate change, it's the Liberal Party that for 11 and a half years dismissed a growing scientific consensus as alarmism, Order. as moralising, and now, apparently, in this form of revisionism by the previous Prime Minister as intellectual bullying. Mr Speaker, this was the party who in government demonised Vice President Al Gore. This was, the, this, was the government, this was the government formally who refused to put the issue of climate change on the agenda for the South Pacific nations. And Mr Speaker, this is the former government that now has a member who made an interesting contribution, who made an interesting contribution in the House just last month. And I refer to the contribution by the member for Barker, who spoke on climate change in the parliament in 2008, and he offered a scientific analysis from which he concluded it follows that climate change 
cannot be attributed solely or even partly to human origins. Oh. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me take this opportunity to refer the member and other members to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 1995, the balance of evidence suggests that there is a discernible human influence on global climate. In 2001, there is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. There's more of this. And Mr. Speaker, just last year, most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid-20th century is very likely due very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Mr Speaker, is this intellectual bullying? Is it moralising? The fact is that there's been no greater barrier to serious action on climate change Minister than the remarks and the seat. thoughts— Minister will resume his seat. Minister will resume his seat. Member for North Sydney on a point of order. Mr Speaker, this diatribe has been going for more than five minutes now. I ask you, ask you to bring him back to the question. He was not asked about alternate views. If he hasn't got a proper answer, we've got plenty of questions Member for over North here. Sydney, resume his seat. The minister was asked about barriers to greenhouse gas reductions. The minister Thank will you, bring Mr. his Speaker. answer to a close. Uh, the yes, member sir. for Barker, Mr Speaker, I conclude, went on to advise that the most sensible approach to climate change, and I quote, would be to adapt. Well, Mr Speaker, the Australian community adapted. They took the most sensible approach to climate change, and that was to elect the Rudd Labor government, a government that would take climate change seriously. The member for Warringah. Well, Mr Speaker, my question is uh, again to the Prime Minister. Uh, if the Prime Minister won't guarantee uh, that carers and seniors' lump sum payments will continue in this budget, and if he won't guarantee an increase in the basic rate of payment to carers and seniors, how will he ensure that carers and seniors uh, will not be a dollar worse off in the budget, as he has just assured the House? And I ask further, Mr Speaker, does he really understand the anxiety that his indecision and vacillation uh, is causing some of the most vulnerable people in our country. Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. As I said the other day, there's no <coughs> intention whatsoever on the part of the government to leave carers or pensioners in the lurch. The government, the government, that, the I lead, the government that I lead take seriously the concerns of working families, take seriously the concerns of pensioners, take seriously the concerns of carers. In my Order. engagement with carers right across the country, the work that they do, hundreds and thousands of them, right Order. across Australia, is to be admired and supported by the community and supported by appropriate payments from the taxpayer. And I confirm again, Mr Speaker, for the benefit of the honourable member, that carers, when it comes to bonuses, will not be a dollar worse off as a consequence of this budget, nor will pensioners. The member for Bass. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment, Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Will the Minister update the House on the timing of the implementation of the government's laws to end the making of Australian workplace agreements, a key part of Labor's fair, flexible and balanced industrial relations system? Yeah. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Bass for her question. Of course, as members of the House are aware, the government was elected on the basis of its policy Forward with Fairness, a new workplace relations system for the Australian nation. And the bill before the House, the Transition to Forward with Fairness bill, is the first part of the government's plans to ensure that fair, flexible and balanced workplace relations system. It would, of course, end forever the ability of anyone in this country to make an Australian workplace agreement. And we know Australian workplace agreements have hurt Australian working families by taking away hard-earned pay and conditions. This matter is not only before the House, but it's before a Senate inquiry due to report on the 17th of March. Mr Speaker, it is the government's intention when that Senate inquiry reports to have the bill dealt with by both Houses of Parliament prior to the House rising before Easter. 
This will enable the bill to be proclaimed into law shortly after Easter and to deliver on one of the government's important election commitments to end the making of Australian workplace agreements. Mr Speaker, the Australian people voted for this at the last election. They know what they want. The Australian government, the Rudd Labor government, knows where it stands. We stand behind our policy forward with fairness. Unfortunately, the opposition has been unable to articulate a coherent position on Labor's bill, and I am concerned that their dithering and vacillation will mean that there is delay in dealing with this bill before the parliament. Mr Speaker, can I direct your and the House's attention to an article by Steve Lewis published on 23 February? In that article, Mr Lewis reports that the deputy leader of the opposition uh, said that when it came to defending Australian workplace agreements, her colleagues, the member for North Sydney and the member for Warringah, quote, went to water. Now, having read that article, I thought clearly the deputy leader of the opposition stood firmly behind AWAs and firmly behind work choices. Now, one have, would have to give that points for bravery, Mr. Speaker. A bit like the Black Knight in Monty Python, she was going to fight on that election loss was just a flesh wound. She was going Order. to defend work choices. Then, of course, Order. Mr. Speaker, last trope. week this belief that the opposition stood behind work choices and AWAs was further reinforced when the former Prime Minister gave a speech in the United States defending work choices and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition described it as an excellent speech. One could only conclude from that statement that they were going to fight on in defence of AWAs and in defence of work choices. Deputy Prime Minister, resume your seat. The member for North Sydney on a point of order. Again, Mr Speaker, uh, my recollection of the question is that it didn't ask for alternative views. And I ask you to bring the uh, Deputy Prime Minister back to the question that was asked. Order. The question related to the up, an update on the timing and implementation of the laws. The Deputy Prime Minister will address her response to that, that aspects of the question. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I am addressing the matter of timing because, of course, the timing is contingent on the bill going through the parliament, and whether or not quick passage of this bill is going to be facilitated depends in part on the position of the opposition. It is a material fact, Mr Speaker, to the question of timing. Then, of course, we got a different position from the opposition, hence the confusion and hence the risk to timing on the weekend when the deputy leader of the opposition appeared on national television and said that the opposition did not support but did not oppose the government's bill. Now, Mr Speaker, is this a riddle that we are supposed to puzzle out? Did not support and did not oppose the bill. What is the meaning of this nonsense? By the standard of these contributions, Mr Speaker, the next thing we will hear from the opposition, and I'm surprised we didn't hear it today on climate change, is them wandering out telling age-old riddles like, if a tree falls down in a forest and no one's there, oh, does it make the, a sound? That will be the, the next quality resume, contribution. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. The Deputy, the Deputy Prime Minister will bring her answer to a close. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And of course, on the question of timing, what we are seeking is a straightforward answer from the opposition to a very simple question. It's not a trick question. It's not a hard question. It's a simple question. And the question, Mr Speaker, is if a division, if a division on Labor's Order. bill is caused in either House of Parliament Will the, the opposition Deputy vote Prime for Minister the bill, not against the, the bill, answer, or try hiding will bring it in to the corner, close. hoping that no one notices that they are still supporters of work choices? Right. It's, a key, it's a key question on the timing the, of the bill. It's a question the, the Australian Deputy, people who voted Deputy, for fairness and certainty in workplaces are entitled to. The member for Warringah. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, my question is. If it's the Prime Minister's position that someone must suffer in the fight against inflation, why has he decided that carers and pensioners should be the sacrificial victims? And if it was right to pay carers and seniors lump sum payments last year when the surplus was $12 billion, why is it wrong to do so this year 
with an even higher surplus. Will these lump sum payments be made? Yes or no? The Prime Minister. Mr. Um, Speaker, in response to the honourable member's question from the New Party of Compassion opposite, um, <laughs> given their given their long, the long-standing long commitment that they uh, oh. have to. Um, uh, the bonuses to carers and pensioners. It's pretty interesting when you look at the actual Ford estimates produced in the last That's budget. Right. Um, Order. Where do you see any commitment on the part of the previous government to the payment of this one-off bonus next Order. year? The minister for trade. The year after? Absolutely. The one after that? The one after that? In fact, it's missing in action. It isn't there. In fact, if you go to the fine print of the government's, uh, previous government's position on this, it was uh, these one-off payments, we don't rule them out for the future, subject to economic circumstances. Such is the depth of the continued commitment of compassion on the part of those officers. I return to what I said before. When it comes to bonus payments to carers and pensioners, they will not be a dollar worse off as a consequence of the upcoming budget. The member for Lyons. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the call. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the Minister advise the House on progress on the implementation of the government's election commitment to withdrawal of troops from Iran? And uh, what's communities from Iraq? Iraq. Oh. Order. Yeah, you didn't quite get there, did you? You didn't quite get there. Sorry. George had it on the agenda, but he didn't quite get it there. But All right. The, the member for Lyons has the uh, call. Okay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, withdrawal of troops from Iraq. And what community support is there for the government's actions? The, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, thank you, the uh, member Mr. for Speaker. La Trobe will be sent somewhere. The member for foreign, Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm asked about the government's election commitment so far as troop withdrawal from Iraq is concerned, and and Order. the community support for that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you would have members would of course be aware of the government's election commitment to withdraw the uh, combat forces, the combat troops from Iraq, the so-called Overwatch battle group, and to do that by the middle of uh, this year. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, members will also recall the fierce criticism, the fierce criticism, that that election commitment was subject to by the then government, by the Liberal Party, by the then leader of the opposition, by the leader of the opposition, who was then Defence Minister. The fierce criticism that election commitment was subject to. There was a very stark contrast between the Labor Party's approach to withdraw troops and the Liberal and National Party's approach, who said that this would be a disaster, a disaster of mammoth proportions. That this would split the alliance. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to advise that the government is implementing this election commitment in consultation with the United States and uh, the United Kingdom, and that implementation is on course and going very smoothly. The Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence raised this matter when the Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence visited uh, Iraq in December of last year. I raised this issue and spoke to the Secretary of State and other officials when I was in the United States in January, and recently the Minister for Defence and I, when we hosted the Osmin conference here, discussed the matter further with, uh, with the United States. And our approach to withdraw at the end of the current rotation, minimum disruption, has been welcomed. That approach has been welcomed by the United States. I'm asked about uh, community support, Mr. S Mr Speaker. There is widespread community support, widespread community support for the implementation of the government's election commitment in this respect. Widespread community support. So widespread, Mr. Speaker. So widespread, Mr. Speaker. It's spreading to areas previously unthought of. Spreading to areas previously unthought of. Despite his trenchant criticism, despite his trenchant Order. criticism of the, gov of the government's election commitment, recently the leader of the opposition, recently the leader of the opposition said, our position is that the combat troops would actually be withdrawn at the end of June. Also. The Leader of the Opposition our position is Order. that the combat troops would actually be withdrawn at the end of June also. 
One policy before the election, different policy after. One position before the election, different position after. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we know that the Liberal Party and the Leader of the Opposition have lost their way. We know the Leader of the Opposition has lost his way. But there's one area, one area, Mr. Speaker, one area to which the widespread community support for the government's election has not spread. One area that it has not spread to, John Winston Howard. And in a speech recently in the United States, he said that the implementation of the government's election commitment was disappointing, was disappointing, and could lead to a tragedy. Was disappointing and could lead to a tragedy. But, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Order. despite the fact, despite the fact that the overwhelming, the overwhelming and widespread community support has not spread to John Winston Howard, the government will persist. The government will continue. The government will not deter. The government will continue to implement its election commitment. The government will stay the course Order. in the implementation of its election commitment to withdraw troops from Iraq. Unlike, unlike the leader of the opposition, unlike Order. the Liberal Party, unlike the leader of the Liberal Party, unlike, unlike the leader of the opposition, there will be no cutting and running. No cutting and running. Unlike the Liberal Party, cutting and running from the previous position, cutting and running from the previous Prime Minister, cutting and running from John Winston Howard. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Uh, I refer the Prime Minister to the case of Mrs Pat Stafford, who has motor neurone disease, and who says that the carer's bonus enables her and her husband to keep their 25-year-old car on the road. Is the Prime Minister aware that her husband, Henry, thinks that without the lump sum payment, Pat would end up in an institution? Is the Prime Minister aware that over the weekend Pat Stafford said that, and I quote, John Howard was the quiet achiever, but Kevin Rudd has turned out to be the quiet deceiver? End of quote. In the, light of his failure, in the light of his failure to guarantee that carers' lump sum payments will be paid, will the Prime Minister have the decency to apologise to Pat and Henry Stafford and the 400,000 carers who feel betrayed? The Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Order. Mr Speaker. In response to the honourable member's question, I would say to Mr and Mrs uh, Stafford that uh, when it comes to the upcoming budget, they will not be a dollar worse off when it comes to their bonus payments. Um, and uh, that is our guarantee. And the reason it's our guarantee is that these are among the most vulnerable Australians. And therefore, therefore for, those, for those reasons, they need to have an assurance from the or government the from the Patterson. parliament that their payments are in order. It's not exactly the insurance that order. they had. Um, from the previous government in its election commitments when asked on this matter, the previous government's policy contained in the coalition government policy election 2007 on this very question says, if re-elected, the coalition will consider continuing to pay these bonuses, wait for it, wait for it, Order. wait for it, comma, depending on the economic circumstances at the Order. time. I take Order. it that equals a rock solid commitment from those opposite. Mr Speaker, they have from this government a guarantee that carers, when it comes to their bonuses, will not be a dollar worse off. I stand by that commitment, and this underlines the hypocrisy of those who stand opposite. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move a motion of censure against the Prime Minister. Yes. Is, is leave granted? Yes. 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 Leave is granted. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move a motion of censure against the Prime Minister. I leave move is... that this House... I move that this House... Uh... Order. The I move the opposition. that this House censures the Prime Minister and the Government for its plans to cut the benefits received by 400,000 carers and more than 2 million seniors, elderly and frail Australians. In particular, I move to censure the Prime Minister and his government for failing to guarantee that the carers and seniors' bonuses paid in the last budget, when the surplus was $12 billion, will be paid in the forthcoming budget, when the surplus is expected to be much larger. For failing to detail any alternative means to ensure that carers and pensioners will not be worse off as a result of the budget as promised, 
and for leaving two and a half million Australians in a state of uncertainty over their future because this government does not understand how to manage the economy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Liberal and National parties in government built a strong economy for Australia. Yeah. It was an economy of sustained and strong growth, an economy that delivered record low unemployment, an economy that delivered strong business confidence and investment. It was also a government that delivered surplus budgeting to Australia, which had been unknown when there was a change of government from the last Labor government in 1996. The Liberal and the National parties in government built a strong economy so as to give Australians confidence, confidence in ourselves and confidence in our future. But it also built a strong economy to, to enable this nation to care for its weak, its vulnerable, its sick and its elderly. In its last four budgets, Mr Speaker, the previous government delivered, amongst other things, a $1,600 lump sum cash payment to some 400,000 carers, a carer payment and a carer allowance at a cost of just under $400 million. Disability and carers in those in support under the previous government over 11 and a half years benefited from a 75 per cent real increase in funding under the previous coalition government. There were in those carers, Mr Speaker, 400,000 recipients. And in fact, in 2005, Access Economics, in its study of the contribution of Australia's carers to this nation, estimated that they contribute 1.2 billion hours of care, which is equal to more than $30 billion of formal aged and disability care services. So, Mr Speaker, who are these carers? Some 400,000 or so. They are men and women who are frequently faceless, who neither seek nor or receive reward in any visible or public way for what they do every single day. They are men and women who are caring for frequently adult disabled children, they are caring for someone whom they love, who is in need of desperate support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are men and women who have adult parents who are in desperate need, who have children of all ages, who frequently juggle a job if they can afford to find any time at all to do it. They live across a 24-hour cycle on anything from one to three or four hours sleep, and they do so seven days a week, uh, 365 days of the year. They are the unsung heroes of this nation. They are the real saints of Australian society. When we talk about an Australian community, these are the men and women who give real meaning to what it is to be a community, to give effect to the thing that we describe colloquially as mateship, to putting yourself out for someone else to go the extra mile, to do the things that are important. And they do so with limited amount of support and under this new elected government, even less confidence in their economic future. Mr Speaker, as I said to the Prime Minister last week, for God's sake, these are the real heroes of our nation. They are the real saints and they deserve our strong support. So, Mr Speaker, it was with a great sense of alarm when the Australian newspaper arrived on Friday with a headline that said, and I quote, Razor Gang slices out compassion as carer bonus is slashed, with a photograph of Mr Ashley Norman and his wife Pat in the outer suburbs of Mackay, whom I have subsequently visited. I might point out to the House, Mr Speaker, that the chairman of the Razor Gang, the chairman of the Expenditure Review Committee, according to the government's own online directory of government services, the chairman of this Razor Gang 
responsible for a cartoon of our Prime Minister letting a man in a wheelchair go down the side of a mountain, the chairman of the Razor Gang is the Prime Minister. This is the man whose background as a public servant is now coming to the fore. The bureaucrat who in Queensland was responsible for the dismissal of so many working Australians who went from being working families to workless families. Mr Speaker, it's important for us to appreciate that the extent to which we reach out to and support carers and those whom they love and for whom they provide, the elderly and the frail, are the critical measures of a caring society and the critical measures of a caring government. The response to this headline, Mr Speaker, in this story was not for the Prime Minister and not for any one of his ministers to come out and say, no, it's not true. To, basic, to say instead that the lump sum payment is guaranteed. The Prime Minister may say that he hasn't got it in his budget for his so-called forward estimates, but I can sure as hell tell the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, that these 400,000 carers have got it in their budget. Yeah. When I went to Mackay on Saturday to visit the victims of flood and support and thank the carers and volunteers and emergency services, I went to see Mr Ashley Norman and his wife Pat. They live in a modest, small dwelling in the outer suburbs of Mackay. Ashley Norman is 73 and he's dying. He's oxygen dependent. He takes 20 medications a day. He's had major heart surgery. He's had at least two significant heart attacks. His lung capacity is down to 35 per cent. He has an abdominal aortic aneurysm which can rupture at any time. He has severe diabetes. He has peripheral neuropathy, which means he, for different reasons, but like our Prime Minister, can't feel what's going on in his extremities, and his wife of 52 years, Pat, who looks after him 24 hours a day and looks after him, as he described to me, as a baby, of 52 years of marriage, that woman gives him support 24 hours a day. And without her, as he said to me, Brendan, I would be dead. D-E-A-D. -E and as far as that $1,600 is concerned, it may not mean much to a Prime Minister or a Minister of a Government with the incomes that we collectively earn in this place, but it sure as hell means a lot to Ashley Norman and Pat, and it means a hell of a lot to the 400,000 carers throughout this country. What's been the response of the Prime Minister? He said publicly yesterday, and it took it wasn't lunchtime Friday. We had an issue, another issue involving, involving care recently, and the problem was sorted by lunchtime. We didn't have this one sorted by lunchtime. We didn't have it sorted by Friday night. It wasn't there by Saturday when we got up to another headline that said, now the Razor Gang, chaired by the Prime Minister, is going for seniors. Instead, he sent his ministers out to run some drivel about budget process. You sound like a bunch of bureaucrats being run by a bureaucrat. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean to someone struggling with a husband dying from motor neurone disease? What does it mean to an adult that's got an ageing mother with Parkinson's disease incontinent at three o'clock in the morning and desperately having to buy a new fridge? What does it mean to Ashley and Pat Norman and their family who haven't had a holiday for 20 years? What it means is that they cannot budget. The government's going through the process as it should of budgeting for our nation's finances, and we just hope they know what they're doing and that they get it right. But there are some things that rise above it. Whoever was the source of this story out of the Razor Gang, chaired by the Prime Minister, was trying to do something to protect these people. Because unlike our Prime Minister and our new government, they at least appear to appreciate what this means to everyday fair dinkum Australians. Yeah. These are not only people who are struggling with grocery prices if they can afford a 25-year-old car like Pat Stafford to be able to run it. These are not just people that are struggling with their credit cards. These are people, Prime Minister, who are literally struggling to survive. 
where life is a day-to-day -day struggle for survival. Those lump sum payments delivered by the previous government in the last four years were a consequence of delivering a strong economy. It was a consequence of tough decisions made by the member for Higgins as Treasurer, the former member for Benelong and everybody that was then sitting on that side. Decisions that were opposed by those who are now in government. And the first thing that we did when in government was to say, right, who's at the top of the list? Who are the people now that we've paid off the Labor government's debt? Now we've got interest rates down to a manageable level. Now we've got lots more working families because we had unemployment at a 30-year low. What was the group of people we put at the top of that list? At the top of that list, we put the Pat Staffords. We put Ashley and Pat Norman. We put the men and women of this country who are the most deserving people who are so desperately in need of financial support. And we delivered to them a $1,600 lump sum payment. And we delivered it every year for four years. So I say, Mr Speaker, to the Prime Minister and the government, put aside your pride and embarrassment about being caught out on this. Put aside the fact that the all-controlling Prime Minister would not allow his ministers to sort this out and end the grief and distress amongst Australia's vulnerable carers, seniors, elderly and frail. And I say to the Prime Minister, notwithstanding the fact that we feel so strongly about this, that we are censuring the Prime Minister, I say to the Prime Minister, just get up. For God's sake, get up, stand in front of that microphone and say to the carers of this country, I, the Prime Minister of Australia, believe in you and will deliver you a lump sum payment in the budget. It is not that hard. We were lectured and told it wasn't hard to do some other things. And we on this side have gone through a process of supporting things which we believe are in the nation's best interests. This is not only in the nation's best interests, this is in the interests of men and women who feel that they have no voice. The reason why the carers have all been out and saying the things they have is not because they're political activists. They have different political views. Some of those carers who received that $1,600 and the seniors and the elderly who received the $500 lump sum payment from the previous coalition government, they didn't vote for us. That's not what this is about. This is about them. It's not about us. It's not about bureaucrats. What is it that the Labor Party doesn't get that is so now occupied by former union officials and political apparatchiks that it has lost sight and bureaucrats that it's lost sight of what government is about? The reason why the people in this gallery, the reason why the people watching this on television elect a government is they expect men and women of decency who understand and care for them to stand between them and the bureaucrats that could otherwise run the country. That is why this is so important. The Prime Minister said yesterday they won't be a cent worse off. He said it again today in the House, which is why we have had to run this censure, why we've had to censure the Prime Minister, a very, very serious thing. He said they won't be a cent worse off than they would otherwise be. He has refused to guarantee the lump sum payment. Now, for someone earning $250,000 a year, a lump sum payment of $1,600, you probably think, well, you know, what's that? You know, it's my credit card payment or whatever. Can I just say to the Prime Minister, having spent much of my professional life when I was practising medicine working with these families, can I tell you, when you're with them at 3 o'clock in the morning and they haven't slept for 24 hours, and they've got not one but two severely autistic children, I can tell you, Prime Minister, that a lump sum payment is everything. If you're hanging out for that lump sum payment, it is absolutely essential for your budgeting. It's the difference between sinking and swimming. And that's why the, ha the coalition government and the Liberal and National parties delivered it. And that is why it is so important, not for the political interests of the government, but so important for these men and women 
about whom this censure and this debate is about, that this has to be delivered. This morning I listened to AM. I also listened to Radio National. I listened to Fran Kelly interview Nell Brown. I hope the Prime Minister heard the interview. And if the Prime Minister did not hear the interview, could I just ask him to get one of his many helpers to actually get an audio out of the interview? Nell Brown has a daughter, an adult daughter in her 20s. She doesn't just have an intellectual disability, Prime Minister. She also suffers from schizophrenia. She was asked by Fran Kelly this question. There has been some talk about stretching over the course of the year. Would that help? So the question is, so would the payment, the $1,600, instead of a lump sum, if it was parked into about $30 a week parked into your payment, would that help? So she's asked that question. This woman's not a, some sort of political activist. For God's sake, she's trying to run a part-time job and look after her adult daughter. So what did she say when she was asked whether it would help you know, to spread it over the year, which would be the Prime Minister's she won't be a cent off remark? After five days, I might add. Not on day one, not on day two. Five days. It took him five days to say anything the same time he was overseas. So what did she say when she was asked this? She said, and I quote, no, not at all. And she went on to say, when you actually get a lump of money put in your hand, and so if you are desperate for something, you can have it. Desperate. Desperation. These are lives that are lived in quiet desperation, with limited support. And imagine, Prime Minister, being in a situation where you have a child who has an intellectual disability and then compounded by developing schizophrenia in a young adult life. Then you find out what the, the services run by the states are actually like and how poor they are, particularly in Queensland as a result of uh, a certain fellow known as Dr Death in an earlier government up there. That's when you find out just how lousy the services are. Desperation is the word. These men and women every day are desperate, and they desperately need a lump sum payment because there is a hell of a difference if you are struggling on $12,000 a year or $15,000 a year, there is a hell of a lot of difference between $30 a week and $1,600 coming as it has under the coalition, Liberal National Parties, over the last four years. Now, that may not mean much to some people that earn high incomes. They may wonder what this is all about. My plea to the government and to the Prime Minister is walk a mile in their shoes. Yeah. You don't have to spend a week with them. Just spend 24 hours with them. You've sent your members out to go and visit schools. So then we've had bread and circuses for three and a half months, which has passed for government. And one of the little things was to send all of the Labor backbenchers out to visit a school. You know, the education revolution. My challenge to the Prime Minister is send them out and go and spend 24 hours with a carer yeah. and ask the carers whether the $1,600 lump sum payment is important to them. That's what you actually need to do, Prime Minister. So, Mr Speaker, we believe Australians have been betrayed. Yeah. We believe that Australia's carers, their seniors, the frail, the elderly, we believe the Ashley and Pat Normans of this world have been betrayed. And it is absolutely essential that the Prime Minister redeem not only the confidence that they must have in the government of the day, but redeem himself by coming to that dispatch box now and saying they will receive a $1,600 lump sum yeah. payment so they can get on with their lives and literally live those lives. Yeah. Yeah. Is, the motion, is the motion seconded? Uh, yes, sir. The member for Warringah. Um, I second the motion and reserve my right to speak. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition of Censure and the Prime Minister be agreed to. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The problem with this uh, censure motion is just based on a false premise. The, cha the charge is that um, in relation to the bonus system that the government won't guarantee that pensioners and carers uh, will be um, financially uh, worse off. We have made a very clear-cut commitment that when it comes to the bonus system, uh, we have guaranteed that 
carers and pensioners will not be financially worse off as a result of the budget. That position Order. was made absolutely clear by the government before Parliament convened. It's been made absolutely clear on the Hansard here in Parliament today that pensioners and carers, when it comes to their bonus payments, won't be a dollar worse off. But despite the fact that that assurance has been provided prior to coming into the Parliament, despite the fact that that assurance has been provided on at least four or five occasions in the Parliament in response to the various questions legitimately asked by those opposite, we're here to be responsible to those uh, who constitute the opposition. Despite Remember having said Diamond. that time and time and time again, because it's in the pre-positioning of the Opposition Tactics Committee to have a censure motion on this matter, off they go. The answer that you wanted and the answer that you wanted, the guarantee that you wanted provided, has been provided. And it has been done Order. in absolute Order. black the and Prime white Minister terms. Resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition was heard in silence. This is a serious matter. The Prime Minister should be heard in silence. Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. So the guarantee is clear cut when it comes to carers and pensioners and uh, the uh, impact of the bonus system on them. They will not be a dollar worse off. And beyond that, what we have said is that we need to work through ways and means by which those who receive these bonus payments can have payments made to them on a more secure footing into the future. And we believe that is a reasonable way to proceed. It does contrast with the position which has been taken by those opposite on this matter. Because when we went into the last election, what was the commitment of those opposite? First thing you look at to see whether a government has had a serious systemic commitment to making bonus payments to either carers or pensioners is to look for one Remember document. For and it's called the budget papers, and within the budget papers, to go to the Ford estimates and to go to the relevant entry under the subprogram entry. And what do you find there? You find no commitment at all on the part of our predecessors, none whatsoever. So there has been no long-term commitment by those opposite to these bonus payments in the past. That's simply a fact. The fact is reflected in the actual construction of the budget papers. Then go to the next point. Dealing with this in the election context, and here I quote from this colourful document, the coalition government's election 2007 policy better support for carers, go for growth. There you go. Minister. We flip over to page six. More financial support for carers. This is not ripped out of context. It is in the section entitled More Financial Support for Carers. Go to the relevant paragraph, neatly tucked up the end, because you usually tuck things up the end and you hope no one actually gets that far. Last sentence, last paragraph on the page, it says as follows. A re-elected coalition government will consider continuing to pay these bonuses, first qualifying clause, second qualifying clause, depending on the economic circumstances at the time. There has been no forward commitment by those opposite at all, none whatsoever. It is grossly misleading on the part of those opposite to put a view to carers and pensioners across the country that they were locked in to doing this were they re-elected. It is untrue. It is demonstrated by the document to be untrue. It's there in black and white. Then we go to, then we go to how these matters have been treated by the previous government in previous years. Member for Fadden. Every budget night, and I've attended a few when the member for Higgins would stand here and deliver the budget, if you look at uh, his statements, he says repeatedly, tonight I announce that. In terms of bonus payments for carers, I announce that. I announced this one-off payment. The Member same the in 2004, the same in 2005, and I have here 2007, a one-off seniors bonus payment. These are one-off announcements. That's how you have described them, each budget that you have done them. Four previous budgets in the case of the carer's payment, one previous budget when it comes to the $500 Order. payment as it relates to pensioners. These are one-off statements one-off announcements and, and uh, described as such by the Treasurer himself. Therefore, where does the evidence leave us? The evidence leaves us as follows. First of all, nothing in the Ford estimates on the part of those opposite, nothing whatsoever. Secondly, we have an explicit statement in the colourful document which says 
that they may consider this, depending on the state of the economy. And thirdly, when you look at the way in which this has been handled in previous years, they are explicitly addressed as a series of one-off statements announced, repeat, announced on the night. And so what you therefore have on the part of the government uh, is something considerably in addition to what's been provided by those opposite. Member that for is, a guarantee is now. We're in March. The budget's not due till May. Previous government practice, if we're applying the same uh, standards, would be shut up, say nothing until, until budget night in May. Uh, then, the pre then the Treasurer stood up in the past and said, here is the one-off announcement. What we are doing in March is standing up and providing this guarantee to carers and pensioners now. That represents a significant departure on the part of uh, previous practice. Of course, on top of that, there are a range of other measures which we have embraced as well. And they, of course, go to what we can do uh, for utilities payments uh, for carers and pensioners. We're committed to a $4.1 billion program that will benefit over 3 million Australians. And this will go to 2.6 million aged income support recipients, 277,000 Commonwealth senior, Seniors Health Card holders, 700,000 disability support pensioners, 160,000 carer payments recipients. Over 3 million Australians, a $4.1 billion payment, and in each case, a quarterly payment of $125 when it comes to a utilities allowance. This is of real and measurable benefit, not just to pensioners, but also to those uh, who are providing services as carers, as recipients of the carer payments. What we have, therefore, is not only a guarantee when it comes to these bonuses, you also have a guarantee from us when it comes to these utilities allowances, four by $125. And the reason we have done that is because the bills come in regularly for people when it comes to electricity and rates and the rest. Not just an annual payment, not a biannual payment. A lot of these bills come in quarterly. Therefore, the, why, the reason we designed these payments on a quarterly basis was to ensure that carers and pensioners and others would have access to these payments to assist them as the bills rolled in the door. In fact, we were attacked for doing it on a quarterly basis, I seem to recall, by the former treasurer, the current member for Higgins, who didn't think this was the right way to go. So you have from us, unlike our predecessors who treated this as a budget night one-off announcement, you have from us in March, two months before the budget, a clear-cut guarantee. Beyond that, you have a clear-cut guarantee on the question of uh, utilities allowance payments, which go to more than three million Australians, and on both those measures, radically in excess of any such undertakings on the part of those opposite in the lead-up to the last election. Of course, the question which arises, uh, Mr Speaker, is why are we having this debate in the first place when it goes to the other part of the censure motion on the question of the economy? Order. You know, the reason we are having a very difficult budget process at the moment is because we've been left with a very difficult Order. economic challenge. And I know Order. those opposite find it very difficult to confront some facts, but I think it's important that they actually go through Deputy facts Leader one by opposition. one that present themselves to the nation right now in terms of the economy we have been left with. Fact one. There is a suggestion by the um, leader of uh, manager of opposition business that this is not relevant to the censure Member motion. For the censure motion deals with the government's management of the economy. I would suggest that the manager of opposition business actually reads the censure motion before he inter interjects to say that he interjects to, to say that these remarks are somehow not relevant to the censure. They are. They're directly relevant to the censure. I read the censure motion Order, the when it was handed to me. Why are we having a difficult debate about budget priorities and about expenditure? Because we have inherited a very difficult set of economic circumstances from our predecessors and from the uh, circumstances which now arise from the international economy. Fact number one. When our government was elected, inflation was running at a 16-year high and is now projected by the RBA to remain high until Order. 2010. Is that incorrect? Is that incorrect? Order. Members on my we inherited left inflation rejecting. running at a 16-year high. Is that incorrect? What's fact number one? No, no dispute from those opposite. Fact number two, when our government was elected, interest rates had risen 10 times in a row and were the second highest in the developed world. That's fact number two. Any, any, any dispute? Fact number three. Productivity growth running at its lowest level in 15 years, and as the Treasurer said in Parliament today, now having ground down to zero. Fact number three. Fact number four. Order, Since 2004 warning. Commonwealth spending has grown at an average of around 4% real 
per year, more rapid growth than any other four-year period in the last decade and a half. And if I recall the presentation of the parliament the other day by the Minister for Finance, running the last financial year at four and a half real. Simply understandable. That's fact number four. Fact number five, at the time of the election, despite the best terms of trade in 50 years, we've generated five and a half years of monthly trade deficits, the longest sequence in Australia's economic history, contributing to Australia's record foreign debt, tripling to a record of $570 billion. Fact number five. And I've got to say, if you put all these things together, what you have is a clear cut summary of the dimensions of the economic challenge that we on this side of the House, the government of the day, have been presented with in terms of the economic performance of those who preceded us. Well, it is a very uncomfortable and confronting fact and set of facts for those opposite to realise that they actually left Australia with a series of far-reaching economic problems. When it, on the inflation Order. front, on the interest rates front, on the productivity Order. front, on government spending out of control. All these are problems which now confront us and actually require a course of action to deal with them rather than pushing them all to one side. So framing a budget under these circumstances is a difficult set of circumstances, combined and compounded by the fact that the state of the global economy means that we have revised downwards growth projections for the United States economy, revised downwards projection for growth in Europe, revised downwards projections somewhat in Japan. And therefore, difficult set of global economic circumstances, but I've got to say an economic legacy from those opposite, uncomfortable, disquieting as they may find it, which frankly registers a fail mark against each of the five to six measures Don't I just ran through. So when it comes to priorities, our challenge, Mr Speaker, is this. How do we manage to maintain responsible economic management, draw government expenditure back under control? eliminate unnecessary spending programs and, at the same time, make sure that we are extending the hand of support to those who need it in the community. Right. And front and centre to those who need support in the community are carers and pensioners. They are among the most vulnerable. What has been interesting in this debate today has been to listen to the faux expressions of compassion by those opposite. A political party in a previous government which, despite for 12 years not having lifted a finger to address the five to six key economic facts and challenges I ran before and instead squandered their inheritance. But on the compassion register, look at work choices, look at the impact on working families, look at the impact on those who are struggling to make the family budget balance at the end of each week, and instead, minister after minister, standing at this dispatch box in the time of the previous government saying, not our problem, we're not faintly concerned about the interests of working families. But beyond working families and beyond those who need a decent and fair industrial Order. relations system, we go back to the core needs of those who are the most vulnerable in our community, carers and pensioners. And I can't think of a more clear-cut commitment than we have given in terms of carers and pensioners for the future. We have a commitment when it goes to uh, them not being any worse off on the, on the question of the bonus payments to uh, carers and pensioners. We have a commitment when it comes to utilities, a commitment given on both cases which precedes the budget by two months, transcending anything which was ever provided by those opposite in previous budgets. I would suggest that those opposite take a long, cold, hard look at themselves against the record that they have left the government on the economy, against also the record specifically in the documents I've referred to about the handling of this bonus matter in the time which they occupied the Treasury benches. Because what I fear is happening, Mr Speaker, is a government applying to ourselves on this side of the House a standard which they never, in 12 years of office, applied to themselves when they are the government of this nation. Uh, Mr Speaker, the government rejects the censure motion, and the core reason for doing so is it is absolutely predicated on a false argument that pensioners and carers would be worse off as a consequence of this upcoming budget on the question of the bonus payments. The member for Warringah. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I think any uh, fair-minded Australian uh, listening to the Prime Minister's contribution to this debate would come to the sad conclusion that this government is suffering from compassion fatigue after just three months in office. Anyone who is listening to the Prime Minister who now turns his back, uh, turns his back on the carers of Australia as well as on the opposition which is speaking for them, anyone who has listened to his contribution would conclude that as far as 
this Prime Minister is concerned, it's all about the economy. It's not about people, Mr. Speaker. It's not about people, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister and members opposite have said, have said that they have inherited that they have inherited a difficult situation. Well, I say, what is so difficult about a $20 billion plus surplus? They have inherited a $20 billion plus surplus and they won't commit. They won't commit to give any of it back to the carers and pensioners of Australia by way of these lump sum payments. Shame on you, Prime Minister. Shame on you, Minister for Families. Shame on you, Deputy Prime Minister, for abandoning and dumping the most vulnerable people in our society in this way. Mr Speaker, let's just make it absolutely crystal clear to a Prime Minister and a Minister who don't know what their policy is, exactly what it is, because it was stated in the Sydney Morning Herald last Friday, and I quote, the federal government faces criticism from carer groups after it decided not to match a $1,600 bonus payment made to carers by the Howard government in recent years. Now listen to this, Prime Minister. Listen to this, Minister for Families. A spokesman for the Minister for Families, Jenny Macklin, confirmed the decision last night, saying it was part of the government's plan to cut spending. Dumping, dumping the carers' lump sum payment, dumping the pensioners' lump sum payment is part of the government's plan to cut spending. This, Mr Speaker, is about the bonus payment that the Howard government has paid for the last four years. Will it or will it not be paid this year? Now, instead of guaranteeing that it will be paid, uh, this Prime Minister, now trying to cook up uh, some kind of a fix uh, with the Leader of the House, I tell you what, uh, Prime Minister, if you want to get out of this mess, don't consult the Leader of the House, the author of, of the Manic Fridays, Mr Speaker. Uh, I tell you, this, this Prime Minister refused uh, to give uh, a guarantee that the bonus payment will be made, instead saying that they would not be worse off. And he said uh, that this meant uh, that uh, they could all uh, relax and be reassured. In other words, what he tried to do in response to the censure debate today was to give the guarantee that he had refused to give in question time through a series of tortured evasions and circumlocutions and equivocations. I tell you what a guarantee would be. A guarantee would be a letter signed by the Prime Minister of this country saying to the carers and the pensioners of Australia, your bonus payments, your lump sum payments are safe and will be paid in this budget because the surplus will be bigger than ever, our economy is better than ever and you deserve a dividend this year from economic growth as you have had in the last four years from the Howard government. Have the guts, have the guts to sign a guarantee and then people will have the credit. They will give you credit then for at least having the heart uh, to accept that you and your government have made a mistake oh, over the last the four or five years. I tell you what, Madam Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, the cardboard Kev uh, that appeared in this Parliament last Friday, last sitting Friday, has the more heart than the this Prime Minister has shown in the course of question time no. and the censure debate uh, today. No. Now, let's, 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 let's examine exactly uh, what the Prime Minister has said. The Prime Minister has said, and I'm quoting uh, from an AAP report of yesterday, Mr Rudd said Families and Community Services Minister Jenny Macklin was investigating how the system could be improved, saying that one-off payments I'll and bonuses were an inadequate way to deal with welfare on a long-term basis. So here is the Prime Minister who now says that the one-off lump sum payment and bonus uh, is guaranteed for this budget, saying yesterday that it was inadequate. He went on to say yesterday, the challenge that Jenny Macklin and others have been wrestling with is how do we put all this 
onto a more secure, predictable basis for carers and pensioners into the long-term future, rather than having to deal simply with a series of one-offs. Well, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I tell you what: the carers and the pensioners of this country can be trusted with money. They can be trusted to know what to do with $1,600. Or $500, and that's what they would prefer, as has been made abundantly clear uh, over the last few days. But what we had in question time today was a prime minister who would not only guarantee uh, the lump sum payment, but he wouldn't guarantee any alternative way uh, of ensuring that these vulnerable people uh, would not be worse off. He comes in here and he piously says to this chamber. They will not be worse off by one dollar, but refuses to describe a mechanism to ensure that that will be the case. And I say this, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, through you to the carers and the pensioners of Australia. These are weasel words that we have seen from this Prime Minister. You can't trust this Prime Minister, and these bonuses will not be paid until we have a guarantee in writing, signed by this man, that they will be paid. You know what we've seen today, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker? We have seen the Prime Minister reverting to type. Uh, last year we saw caring Kevin. We saw pious Kevin. Uh, we saw statesman Kevin. Member for Ringa will you what we've refer to the Prime today. Minister by I tell you what we've seen today title. from the Prime Minister. Thank we you. have seen him reverting to type a heartless bureaucrat, a heartless bureaucrat who thinks that uh, people are something to be the object of government policy. And I have to say, uh, what the carers of Australia are going to find out over the next few weeks is precisely why this Prime Minister was called Dr Death by the public servants of Queensland when they had to work with him, when they had to experience what uh, the Prime Minister's compassion was really like. But what we've also seen today Madam Deputy Speaker, is a striking contrast between a heartless bureaucrat uh, who sees people as items to be moved around on a policy chessboard and someone who spent most of his ad adult life uh, as a doctor in general practice who understands that human beings are creatures of flesh and blood and they have to be dealt with uh, in decency and compassion by governments. Mr. Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, I regret to say that uh, this government that was elected uh, with so much hope uh, by so many Australians, uh, to the disappointment, uh, admittedly, of people on this side of the House, is already dashing their hopes. Right. It's one thing to sign up to Kyoto. It's one thing to apologise for the past. It's one thing to promise to change legislation, but it is quite another to consistently deliver decent benefits to the people of Australia. And the fact that members opposite think that it is more important uh, to deliver the mother of all budget surpluses than it is uh, to deliver benefits to the people of this country who need it most just goes to show the extent to which modern Labor has lost its soul. There are too many millionaires sitting opposite, Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker. There are too many people who spend their time talking to developers and the big end of town, because that is the only possible explanation as to why this government has completely forgotten the most vulnerable people in our society, the carers and the pensioners who are doing it tough uh, who, but for government benefits, entirely miss out uh, on the prosperity that this country has enjoyed in recent years, and who deserve better from a government which calls itself uh, a Labor government. Now, I tell you what, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, because of this Prime Minister's ineptitude, uh, because he is unable uh, to reconcile uh, the conflicting uh, demands uh, of his hairy-chested economic ministers, uh, and his backbench, who understand, I suspect, uh, just what this is going to do uh, to the carers and pensioners of Australia, we have had five days of vacillation and muddle. Five days of vacillation 
and muddle. And you know, John Howard, the former Prime Minister, uh, he was never one uh, to boast about his compassion credentials. Uh, he was never one uh, to strike his chest and say, look how good I am. Uh, unlike uh, the current uh, incumbent Prime Minister, he just delivered. That's what John Howard did. He just delivered four years, four years of lump sum payments to the carers and pensioners of this country. That's what he did. He delivered. He didn't boast. And what we have from this Prime Minister is a series of pious platitudes, a series of empty assurances not backed up by any specific assurances whatsoever. Now, Mr Speaker, um, what we have seen uh, from members opposite, in the words of one of their former leaders, is a circus of symbolism. The first time they are actually put on the spot, the first time they actually have to come up with a hard commitment, the first time that they are faced with a difficult choice, what do they do? They choose a bigger budget surplus over benefits, tangible, concrete benefits for the carers and pensioners of this country. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, I am confident, more confident than ever, uh, having watched the performance of the Prime Minister, the stumbling, halting, embarrassed, shame-faced performance uh, of the Prime Minister today, uh, attested to uh, by the shocked white faces uh, of the backbench behind him who know he is getting himself into a hopeless muddle. I am confident, having watched that performance today, that the longer this government lasts, the better the Howard government will look. The longer, the longer we have a situation where members opposite are taking the $500 and the $600 and the $1,000 lump sum payments away from vulnerable people, the more the Howard government will look like a golden age of compassion and decency. A golden age of compassion and decency. Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, this Prime Minister uh, was the person uh, who uh, opined at great and pious length uh, in the monthly magazine at the end of 2006 about how all John Howard was interested was me, myself and I. I tell you what, John Howard delivered. John Howard gave the people of this country uh, the support that they needed. This was a Prime Minister who attacked, who attacked what he called Howard's Brutopia. Well, who's running a Brutopia now, Madam Deputy Speaker? Is it a Brutopia uh, to pay people uh, a $1,600 lump sum payment and somehow uh, it's a nirvana uh, to take it away? Uh, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, there is something rotten. There is something rotten in this government's makeup. Uh, if this Prime Minister cannot find it in his heart uh, to give those decent, struggling carers and pensioners of this country the lump sum payments that they have been given over the last four budgets, the lump sum payments that they have increasingly come to rely on, and the lump sum payments that they deserve as a dividend from the economic prosperity of our country. Um, I say in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition had some very good advice uh, for this uh, L-plate Prime Minister. Stop talking to the bureaucrats. Uh, stop cutting deals uh, with the faction chiefs. Stop trying to bail out the debt-ridden state governments at the expense of the carers and pensioners of this country. He said uh, to his members, go and visit a school, go and visit a homeless shelter. Well, as the Leader of the Opposition has said, go and spend a bit of time with the carers of our country. Feel their pain. See their need. It doesn't stop. It's 24 hours a day. It's seven days a week. They deserve this payment, the and this payment time should be paid. Has expired. I call the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Service and Indigenous Affairs. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And if there's one thing that uh, I want to say at the outset, it is uh, that uh, we do have a very, very clear understanding of the enormous contribution that carers make 
to the people that they love. I know from my own family the enormous personal sacrifices that people made, make, and they do it because they love the people that they care for. We also know that there's been an enormous lifetime of contribution made by the senior members of this country, and uh, we recognise that and respect it. And that's why we want to make sure that, uh, that they're supported both uh, financially and with the provision of services as they grow older. We know that uh, for many, many carers, the uh, cost of the sacrifice they make is both deeply emotional and financial. It is a very, very tough task that so many people take on, and they take it on because they want to, uh, because of the people that they care so much about. We also know that it is the case that for so many carers in this country, they earn a lot less than uh, other members of our community. In fact, one third of primary carers are in households that rank in the poorest 20 per cent of households in Australia. We do un understand that. We understand it a, as a government. We understand it from our own families. We also know that for many, many of these people, they have very significant additional costs, whether it's for that special medication, whether it's for the equipment they need to help care for their loved ones, whether it's for the additional transport costs they have, the visits backwards and forwards from hospital, all of these, uh, all of these issues do impose an extra financial burden on so many carers in this country. We also know that for many carers, there's often a very significant cost to their own family lives. The pressure on other members of the family, whether it's uh, children. In fact, uh, as one uh, woman said to me, the hard thing for her uh, is not only having to care for the individual child that she has to take on a regular basis to the hospital, but recognising the impact of those many hospital visits on her other children, uh, who often don't have their mother uh, to care for them as much as uh, other children have. So these are very, very significant issues that so many carers do face. Enormous personal sacrifices, enormous financial sacrifices that each and every one of us understand very deeply. And we do have right at our core, right at our core, an unshakable belief, an unshakable principle that all Australians should share in the economic prosperity that this government is ex that this country is experiencing. We think each and every person should share in that prosperity. That's why we're making the changes that we are to the utilities payment, and I'll talk about that uh, in a little uh, bit of time. The Prime Minister has announced uh, quite categorically that the reports that have been uh, out in the media recently that uh, pe pensioners and carers may be worse off are wrong. He has made it absolutely categoric that those reports are wrong. What he's also said, what he's also said is that when it comes to the bonus system, when it comes to the bonuses that have been paid in the past to both uh, older Australians, to senior Australians and to carers, that they will not be worse off. That is a guarantee that the Prime Minister has given to those uh, senior Australians and to carers. But one of the things that this government is prepared to do, unlike the previous government, is actually give some certainty past this budget to those carers and to those seniors. What we want to be able to do to uh, uh, both, those, both of those groups is, is give them greater security into the future. Rather than have to deal, as they did with the previous government, with a series of one-off payments, what we're proposing to do is actually look for new ways to make sure that we can give both older Australians and carers greater certainty into the future. We do know that uh, this is a much greater sense of security than the previous government was ever, pre ever prepared to do. We had the uh, member for Warringah just a few minutes ago saying that the uh, 
previous Prime Minister, John Howard, actually delivered. One thing the previous Prime Minister did not deliver was any sense of certainty into the future about these bonuses, because what we know is that all, of, all the opposition was prepared to do was say, before each budget, we'll give a one-off bonus, bonus. But before the last election, as the Prime Minister indicated in, in his earlier remarks, as the Prime Minister indicated in his earlier remarks, this opposition was not prepared to give any certainty as to whether or not, if they won the election, they would, they would not give any guarantee whatsoever, no guarantee whatsoever, that they would have paid this bonus and certainly gave no guarantee, gave no guarantee that they would pay this bonus or give any security into the future for uh, seniors or for carers. One thing that's very clear from the uh, opposition's election statements and uh, from the uh, state of the budget, when we actually look at the books, when we look at the uh, budget papers from last year, we know that, in fact, this bonus payment was not on the books. If ever we needed any evidence whatsoever about this, this uh, opposition's intentions, this, government, this uh, previous government had no intention of paying this bonus in a secure way. No, no, no commitment whatsoever. What uh, that means is, of course, the government uh, had no commitment, that previous government had no commitment to continuing these bonuses. So we've had the Leader of the Opposition the member for Warringah getting up here making an enormous amount of noise today, but I think they should be honest with the carers that they're speaking to, the carers they're speaking to individually and through this parliament. They made no commitment in the budget last year, they made no commitment in the lead up to the election that they would pay these bonuses. There is no money in the budget for it. And uh, I think a little bit of honesty, a little bit of honesty from the opposition would be welcomed by the carers that they're speaking to. All that they were prepared to do was offer short-term election year bonuses. They were not, in fact, prepared to make an ongoing commitment to carers. They were not prepared to make an ongoing commitment to carers because uh, they had no dedication to really sorting this issue out and giving people the security that they deserve. We do know that, uh, unfortunately, what we had from the, uh, from the previous government just, uh, was just a decision to make uh, things delivered on a one-off basis, not doing it uh, in a continuous way to give people security. I do have to say the other area of uh, hypocrisy uh, from the government, uh, from the opposition, really is uh, quite breathtaking. These are the same people, the same people, and the leader of the opposition and the member for Warringah would have actually been in the cabinet when this decision was uh, taken. They proposed taking the carer allowance away from nearly 30,000 parents of children with a disability. So this is what the Canberra Times actually reported back uh, in August 2003. They said nearly 30,000 families who care for children with disabilities are expected to lose their government carer allowance. Uh, and uh, the article went on to say that these figures uh, show that these uh, tw almost 30,000 fewer families will receive the allowance this financial year. This was a proposition from uh, those in opposition now who are uh, over there uh, making the most extraordinarily hypocritical statements in this, uh, in this uh, debate. Of course, it got much worse in 2003 for these parents of very disabled children. Uh, following the outcry, The Age reported on the 13th of August that parents of more than 5,000 disabled children have lost their $87 fortnightly allowance under a Howard government review. So this is what the previous government was actually on about. Uh, we've had a lot of noise today, a lot of uh, suggestion that things were different. But in fact, when you look at the record, you look at what this government uh, was on about, they actually were not about uh, providing any certainty for the future, making sure that, uh, that carers or seniors were able to cope with uh, the uh, very significant financial pressures that they face. So unlike the opposition, what this government is all about is giving some certainty, 
giving certainty to carers, giving certainty to seniors, because what we want to do is not leave, not leave them hanging. We don't want to leave people hanging until budget night, year after year after year. That's, right. That's the right. task that we've taken on. That's the task we've That's taken the on because it was never taken on by the previous government. There was no previous commitment in the budget to deliver these bonuses. There was no previous commitment given by uh, the now opposition uh, just before the election that they would pay these bonuses. The, the Prime Minister has made it absolutely plain that as far as these bonuses are concerned, no carer, no senior will be worse off. He's also given a guarantee that what we'll do is give some security to these people so that they're not hanging out every budget. They're not hanging out every budget for uh, information about uh, whether or not these, these bonuses will be paid. I do want to uh, also uh, make a few remarks about the very important election commitments that we're about to uh, deliver to over three million Australians, to seniors, carers and people with a disability. And that will be with the increase in the utilities allowance. We're uh, increasing the utilities allowance from its current level of $107 to $500 a year, and we're going to pay it on a quarterly basis. Uh, what we also know is uh, just how important this is for those uh, who are on the seniors concession allowance. So for those eligible self-funded retirees, they too will be getting the uh, $500 utility allowance and it will be paid quarterly to them. In fact, the only threat to this utilities allowance that currently exists is, uh, is, the, is the need for the current opposition to make sure that there's no nonsense in the Senate when this issue is debated this week. This government wants to make sure that this utilities allowance is paid on the 20th of March as we promised. We promised that it would be paid on a quarterly basis. We promised that it will be paid on the 20th, that the first instalment will be paid on the 20th of March. And in fact, the only thing standing in the way of that uh, promise is, in fact, the uh, federal opposition. We want to be able to give. We want to be able to give this additional uh, help to uh, senior Australians, to carers, to people with a disability. So I'd ask the Leader of the Opposition to guarantee that there won't be any delays, no delays in the Senate while this, uh, while this uh, issue uh, is debated so that we can make sure that uh, the seniors, the carers, the people with disability actually get what they need. We hear from those op opposite that, um, that they wanted to uh, do this. They wanted to do it. Well, they actually had 11 years to increase the uh, utilities allowance. They had 11 years to, uh, to make sure that the utilities allowance was available to carers. They had 11 years to make sure that the uh, utilities allowance was available to uh, people with a dis disability. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, each and every one of us know, but more importantly, each and every senior Australian, each and every carer, each and every uh, person with a disability in Australia knows that that utility allowance was, one, not increased to $500 by the uh, previous government. That was never done. That was never done by the previous government. And secondly, it was not extended to carers. It was not, ex it, it was not extended to uh, people with a disability. This, me this money is very important to help people with the rising cost of living. It will be delivered on the, the first instalment will be delivered on the 20th of March next week, as long as the uh, opposition makes sure that it's quickly delivered uh, through the Senate. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, I did say at the outset uh, that we understand the concerns of carers. We understand the very significant financial pressures they're under. We also understand the very significant financial pressures that senior Australians are under. And so that's why we've made sure, uh, and the Prime Minister has assured these most vulnerable members of our community that when it comes to these bonuses, that uh, they won't be one dollar worse off under the forthcoming budget. Order. It is important that people Order. are given that financial the security, and this government will give it to them. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to.
All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Division required, ring the bells. Uh, lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Ryan and Riverina tellers for the ayes and the members for Werrawa and Shortland tellers for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is eyes 59, noes 81. The question is therefore negatived. Members, please resume their places quickly and quietly.
resume their places quietly or quickly. The member for Warringah. My question without notice is to the Prime no, Minister. The member will resume his seat. Been... The member will resume his seat. The member will resume his seat. Members resume their places. Questions without notice. Are there further questions? The member for Leichhardt. Inform the House of the Leichhardt. The member for Leichhardt will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, the continuation of question time was identified. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. I know what is going on here, and it's a try on because of an incident in the last sitting fortnight in completely different circumstances completely different circumstances where people were still resuming their seat because if the member for North Sydney was wanting to take a full picture of the chamber, the member for Leichhardt was standing on his lonesome at his place at the same time the honourable member for Warringah was attempting to get the call. Now, there are, is a limit to the amount of nonsense that I will take. There is a limit. There is a limit. No, I'm, I, I am calling it as something that I believe to be deliberately disruptive. It is not deliberately disruptive. It is about the standards of the House, Mr Speaker. And exactly, that is exactly the point I am making. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. In the other example, I gave a full explanation of what happened. The member for North Sydney might claim that there was some confusion, but the member that did not seek the call could have done something to make sure that that confusion was not the same. In this case, in this case when people were resuming their places, I could have quite easily given the call to the member for Leichhardt straight away with people running around. Because people were on their feet going around. Now look, I am really trying to get the chamber into a point where there is a bit of respect shown to everybody. And in fairness, in fairness, I think that I've tried to, to do the right thing in rotating the call. As I have said to, as I've said to the member for North Sydney privately, and I do not wish to embarrass the member for Wentworth, but I wish he hadn't dropped the two inches. And then this wouldn't be a point. Now the rotation of the call is the member for Leichhardt as the call. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Can the minister inform the House of the latest developments in quarantine? The Minister for Fisheries, Forestry, the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Um, Mr. Speaker, shortly before, no, short, shortly before question time today, uh, I was advised of a certification error by the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service, which may have a significant impact on the beef industry in New Caledonia. AQUIS has advised that on the 23rd of November last year, under the previous government, Cattle were exported to New Caledonia from Australia, which were vaccinated against the disease babesiosis instead of being treated with a, a chemical treatment as required by New Caledonia's import requirements. Animals vaccinated against babesiosis can be a source of infection to ticks. I'm advised that the export of vaccinated cattle to New Caledonia has allowed the disease to enter their tick population and cause a disease outbreak in their local cattle. While information on this issue is still coming to hand, it seems clear, first of all, that there was a certification error by AQUIS and that, as a result of that error, 
there may be a significant impact on the beef industry in New Caledonia. On hearing this information prior to question time, I immediately held a telephone conference with the secretary of my department, who is also the director of quarantine, and am urgently seeking more information, including what assistance measures can be provided to New Caledonia, and hope to meet with their ambassador later today. I understand that AQUIS is seeking expert advice from the Queensland Tick Fever Institute on ways to manage the exported cattle uh, and cattle which have been in contact with the exported animals in New Caledonia. Preliminary advice is that treating all the cattle, those exported from Australia and the New Caledonian cattle, in contact with them by injecting the chemical imazole would kill the organism in the cattle and prevent further transmission of the diseased ticks. I understand that AQUIS is also seeking advice on how to ensure that the disease is eradicated from the New Caledonian tick population. I also took the opportunity uh, during the, the last hour to speak with Russell Bock of the Queensland Tick Fever Institute, who has confirmed that the institute is willing to assist the New Caledonian authorities in whatever way it can to help them deal with the outbreak, including serological testing. Russell Bock raised with me that in order for them to be able to receive the samples, they will require cooperation from AQUIS, and I've received uh, an email in the last couple of minutes from the Director of Quarantine and Secretary of my department confirming that AQUIS will expedite the import permits for samples from New Caledonia to be sent to Australia for serological analysis by the Queensland Tick Fever Centre. Mr Speaker, Members will already be aware that I announced a review into Australia's this is important information and a major impact on the beef industry in New Caledonia. Mr. Speaker, members will be aware that I previously, that I previously announced the review by Mr. Roger Bealeo into Australia's quarantine services. It is important, critically important, both for the protection of the biosecurity in Australia, that our quarantine and biosecurity services be robust. It is also of critical importance for the neighbouring companies to which we provide a service under agreed protocols. This review will help inform that process, and we are also making sure that we meet all our obligations with respect to the government of New Caledonia. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The member for Hinkler.